Acts in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a clerk from a moving company and a woman who wants to relocate to the United States. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, ma'am, and welcome to Australia's Moving Experience. How can I help you? Well, I, I hope you can help me. I'm so up in the air right now. I... Just calm down now. Let me guess. You're moving and it has you a little confused. That's it, exactly. You see, I'm relocating to the United States next month, and I'm having a hard time getting organised. Here, fill out your name and address, and let me ask you a few questions. Oh, what should I call you? My name is Jane, Jane Bond. OK, Jane, first of all, what's your work phone number? In case I have any questions about things. My work phone is 9463 5550. But please try not to call me too often there, my boss hates personal calls. So does mine, ma'am. So does mine. And what address should we ship your things to? My new company is letting me stay temporarily at 509 Clark House. That's C-L-A-R-K, uh, 1137 University Drive in Seattle. Seattle? Beautiful city, I hear. Mountains right beside the ocean, almost. Cooler than Australia, too. OK, and when should we come pack your things? Uh, I guess that would be on Monday, March 11th. Do you want any help with an after-packing clean-up? We do that for a small additional charge. Yes, that would be helpful. I promised the landlord I'd give her the keys back by 5pm on Thursday the 14th. Great. We'll just schedule the clean-up for that day. That way, the place will smell clean and there'll be no dust. Well, you do think of everything. Oh, how much is this going to cost? Here is a list of our basic prices. Oh dear, this seems rather expensive. Yes ma'am, but you're paying for the best. We're careful and we're fast. Like we say, the only thing we break are speed records getting you moved. Well, maybe that's so. Oh, I nearly forgot to tell you, I don't want my furniture shipped with me. I won't be looking for an apartment till after I arrive in America. Would it be possible to put my furniture in storage here for a month, then have it sent along later? Of course, we do that all the time. A couple of other things. Here at A Moving Experience, we try to pack your things logically. We don't just throw stuff in boxes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do you have any special requests? You know, things you want packed in some special place so you know where to find them. Like what? Oh, I don't know. Things like dishes, maybe. Not to be rude, but you look like a lady who likes to eat. Ah, yes, I need my dishes and things where I can find them quickly. Great. We'll put those dishes and cutlery in what we call the emergency pack. Can you think of anything else? I do have an antique tea kettle my great-grandmother gave my mother. I wouldn't want to lose that. So I guess you'd better put that in storage with the furniture. Grandma's tea kettle with the furniture. Got it. Say, how about things like your alarm clock? You don't want to miss your plane on the big day, right? Well, you certainly think of everything. Yes, that's right. I'll also need my alarm clock where I can find it. 
Fine, we'll put that in your personal package. And of course, we'll give you a list of where we pack everything. So all you'll have to do on Thursday the 14th is grab your luggage on your way out the door. Um, I couldn't help noticing the new CD player you're carrying. Is that a Samsung? Why, yes it is. One of their best. Cost me nearly a hundred dollars it did. Do you want to take special care of it? I mean, it's brand new. Take care of it, but nothing special. You can just put it in storage with the furniture. That looks like everything we need here. I guess you're all set. That was certainly quick. Thank you, young man. This has been a most moving experience. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about Runwell, a charity that raises money by organising running races. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to tell you something about the Run Well charity and the work we do. I'll give a brief overview of what we do and I hope you may be able to help and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Runwell's founder, Mike Hughes, took up long-distance running in 1987, raising money by doing sponsored half-marathons, and in 1992 established the charity as we know it today. By 1997, the runs were being filmed by local TV, and today they appear on national TV every year. All the funds collected by Runwell go to the hospital with the idea that those fit enough to run use their energy to assist the provision of people who are unwell for whatever reason. Now, if you want to race, and I assume that's why many of you are here, let me explain a couple of the basics. Races are run by teams, so you need to form and register a team. What you wear to run in is up to you, and I know some teams come up with some pretty wacky ideas. We have a standard design for your numbers, which we ask you to reproduce. So you make them up according to that standard. We don't want to spend valuable funds on doing that ourselves. Now, the race is run as a kind of relay, so while you won't actually compete side by side, we do recommend that you train as a group. This helps to optimise performance and build team spirit. It will also give you a fair idea of how much you need to eat and drink over the race distance. This is clearly essential for an effective performance, so please make sure you come along to the race with sufficient food and drink. Again, we don't spend money on providing that, but you do need to keep yourself going for the 20-kilometre course. The course goes through the town, then out through Highfield Park, concluding in the main square, where the applauding spectators will be ready to greet you. There are many different prizes, including oldest runner, youngest runner, team with the most sponsorship, team with the best costume. That one's donated by Zoom Fashions. The mayor will introduce the Minister for Health, who will hand over each prize to the winners, and then the hospital president will make a short speech.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. OK, that's the big race. But I know there are many people who don't feel they are up to running a 20-kilometre race, but who would nevertheless like to raise money for Run Well. Over the years, we've had experience of many ways of trying to collect money, some very successful, others less so. Now, of course, 20 kilometres is too far for children to run. But there was a sponsored swimming event at the local school last year, and that did very well. People have also tried to organise food-based events, such as selling homemade cakes and bread and so on at the market. And there was a large picnic arranged in four bright gardens, although these events failed to justify the efforts put into them though I'm sure they were very tasty. These days, so many people are out at work all day that going from house to house to collect money isn't very effective. But it is possible to raise useful funds by selling small promotional items, such as badges with the Run Well motif on them. We're currently checking to see if postcards, perhaps showing the race's winners each year, might also be a good idea or not. We do appreciate the efforts that have gone into selling second-hand goods, but to be honest, the returns have not been very high on this. One very dedicated group organised a team quiz recently, which went very well, and it would be good to see more such activities. There's also been talk of a concert, but we'll have to see how plans for that progress. Now, are there any questions at this stage? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between Anne and Marcia. In the first part of this conversation, they are talking about the commands of training dogs. First, look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Complete the table showing different commands for different forms of dog training. So that research paper we have to do next, the one about how our different styles of training dogs, how do you think you'll approach writing it? You know, I've been thinking about it. I feel that the best way to write it is to divide the paper into two main parts. In the first part, We'd be analysing some examples of each style of training dogs. Right, what the styles are. After that, we can talk about how each style can be used so that the dogs learn something different from each one. Indeed. Maybe we could draw a chart and compare examples of each style of training, one at a time. So the different kinds of training would be simple obedience training. There you would have things like teaching them to sit, stay in one place and so on. Right. So included in here would be simple audio commands like speak. Yes, basic commands are just spoken words, aren't they? And then there would be the more guard-oriented training, where the dogs are trained to know a specific place well. Patrolling and barking are probably the best examples, because most people have seen them in many places, especially in homes. 
and this would lead us to the attack dog training, which is physical as well as spoken, training the dog to knock someone down, and even biting if they have to. Right, so there's another category as well, sniffing dogs which make up the searching category. I've read that in the UK, every major airport and government building has these dogs to search for all kinds of dangerous items. In the second part of the conversation, Anne and Marcia talk about all kinds of training and what kind of dogs they are suitable to. Look at questions 26 to 30. As you listen to the conversation, match A, B, C with the following forms of dog training. One has been done as an example for you. Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. I can believe that. Well, we have a good list to build on. We're finally getting started now. So let's try to figure out when each type of dog training should be used. I guess we can start by trying to figure out the best situation for each type of dog training. Hmm, what do you mean? What I mean is whether each type of training should be used with different kinds of dogs. We could use basic obedience training, for example, and ask whether it's more useful for a small dog, a medium-sized dog, and so on. In this case, I'd say obedience training is best with small dogs, because they tend to get excited easily, and this will help keep them out of trouble. OK, that makes sense. Then let's look at physical training. Even though some people think it's ideal for every breed of dog, I think it's better suited to the larger kinds. Small dogs usually just aren't smart enough to understand the physical commands, and they can even get hurt from them. The specialised sniffing training is the same, I think they're better with the more intelligent breeds of dogs, and they're hardly ever useful with really small dogs. Attack training, however, can be useful for every kind of large dog, as long as the dog is treated well and given a lot of care and attention. All right, and what about guard training? Barking is an ideal way for small dogs to guard a home. I know they aren't big enough to stop a person, but making some noise is often all a dog needs to do. Other kinds of guard training like biting, though, are different. I'd always plan to teach those to a smart dog, give them a chance to use their brains and defend their homes. I'd have to agree. Trainers often just teach large dogs to bark at a person when they think something isn't right. But if they know how to use physical skills in a bad situation, they could save their owner's life some day. Yes, I suppose that different people would have different needs for their pets. Right and different trainers would recommend different methods for different breeds. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk from a member of the Conservation Society talking about green cleaning. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here as a representative of the Conservation Society. 
to talk to you about green cleaning. In other words, about ways you can help to save the environment at the same time as saving money. I'll start with saving money, as we're all interested in that, especially students who are living on a tight budget. Probably none of you has sat down and calculated how much you spend on cleaning products each year, everything from dishwashing detergent, window cleaners and so on, through to shampoos and conditioners for your hair, and then those disasters, products to get stains out of carpets or to rescue burnt saucepans. I can see some nods of agreement. Even if you don't spend a lot of time on housework, you'd end up spending quite a lot of money over a period of time, wouldn't you? We can save money on products and also use products which are cheap, biodegradable and harmless to the environment. These I will call green products. Unfortunately, most cleaning products on sale commercially are none of these and many of our waterways and oceans are polluted with bleach, dioxins, phosphates and artificial colourings and perfumes. Also, think how many plastic bottles each household throws away over a year. They'll still be around in landfill when you are grandparents. So we often feel there's nothing we can do to make a difference, but we can. The actual recipes are on handouts you can take at the end of the talk. The sorts of ingredients I'm referring to are things like bicarbonate of soda, eucalyptus oil, ammonia, vinegar, lemons, pure soap. Lastly, many people find they are allergic to modern products. So for all you asthma sufferers, keep listening. Nothing in these recipes should cause you any problems. An end to itching and wheezing. Now you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. So let's start with spills and stains. Soda water is wonderful as an immediate stain remover. Mop up the excess spill, don't rub, but apply soda water immediately. It's great for tea, coffee, wine, beer and milk as is salt or bicarbonate of soda, which will absorb the stain. Then vacuum when dry and shampoo if necessary. While we're talking about disasters, let's quickly look at some others that can be avoided. Bicarbonate of soda is wonderful for removing smells, especially in the fridge. An open box in the fridge will eliminate smells for up to three months and those terrible burnt saucepans, either sprinkle with our good friend bicarb again and leave it to stand, or cover with vinegar and a layer of cooking salt. Bring it to the boil and simmer for 10 minutes, then wash when cool. Much cheaper than a new saucepan. Then there are heat rings on wooden furniture. Simply rub with a mixture of salt and olive oil or for scratched furniture, use olive oil and vinegar. Now, let's look at general cleaning. First, the floors. If your floor covering is made of slate, cork or ceramic tiles or lino, it probably only needs a mop or a scrub with vinegar in a bucket of water. Carpets can be shampooed using a combination of pure soap, washing soda, 
cloudy ammonia and some boiling water. You put a small amount of this mixture onto the mark on the carpet, rub with a cloth until it lathers and then wipe off the excess. A smelly carpet can be deodorised by sprinkling bicarbonate of soda on the surface, leaving overnight and vacuuming off the next day. Cleaning in the kitchen, bathroom and toilet is the next section. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.